we're all good, right? Make sure that's all set. Come on. You guys can see my screen? Yes, yes. I can see it. Yes. Okay, good. All right. <clears throat> All right, so I'm recording and um, again, this is like the second assignment number two, this question. And there's a reason that I'm sure <clears throat> I received a question regarding this one because it is kind of the way they present the question. You know, it's not necessarily um, anything outside of what I have done, but it, oops, but it's just the way they present it that makes it seem more difficult. So I'll show you what I mean. Let me just. Is this working? OK, let's just assume that did that correctly. All right, so I have the, the nice thing is they gave me the null and the alternative hypothesis. They didn't have to do that. Um, I would prefer they didn't just because that would be good practice. But <clears throat> let's say they don't tell me the claim, but obviously the alternative hypothesis is that, you know, a population mean for whatever, I don't have the information, but a population mean for something is less than 33.7. So the claim is that, that the population mean for whatever the population represents is less than 33.7. So the null hypothesis would be the one that represents the equal to portion. And, you know, in this case, you see like in this book, they use greater than or equal to, but the null is always carrying the equal to, right? So, they give me some information. Your sample consists of 39 values, so sample size. N is 39, with a sample mean of 33.1. My sample mean is 33.1. Suppose the population standard deviation is known, sigma is known to be 1.32. So I'm pulling out the, the, the information from the problem the same way that I've done with confidence intervals. And, you know, we're already talking about averages. And again, um, I referred back to this a lot yesterday, right? I did this also with confidence intervals. In this case, we have a claim about a population mean. So we're not dealing with the situation number one, we're dealing with the situation number two. So whenever you're dealing with a claim about a population mean, you have to determine whether sigma is known or unknown. And sigma represents the population standard deviation. So this is very similar to hopefully what you're used to based on what you did with confidence intervals. So they gave us the population standard deviation. So that's my sigma. So that means that sigma is known and therefore I have this, you know, two B case, I'm sorry, two A case. So I would use Z test, I would use inverse norm, dependent on what I want, right? If I want a critical value, inverse norm. If I want the test statistic and the P value, Z test. Using uh, the TI-84 if, if that's what you're using. Um, calculate the value of the test statistic, round to two decimal places. Easy, because all I have to do, I guess I could stick with this color then. All I have to do with that is go um, Z test. They want the test statistic, well, the test statistic and the p-value can be found with these calculator tricks. Z-test, because this is my situation. So let me get my graphing calculator. Stat, scroll over the test. I want Z-test as number one. And I want it to end in test because I'm running a test, right? If I wanted an interval, which is what we did last week and the week before, it ends in interval. We're dealing with a hypothesis test. So when I press enter, same thing like as last week that you guys saw, it was data or stats. And because we have the statistical values, we have stats highlighted. If it's not highlighted, then highlight it. And notice it asks for sigma here because it's Z test. Um, the first thing that they asked me for mu naught, this is basically what we're running the test on. So 33.7 is what goes there. That's kind of like the claimed value. Sigma was 1.32 that was given to us. X bar was given to us as 33.1. Um, N was given to us as 39. What kind of test is it? <clears throat> well, if you remember what I talked about yesterday, um, where was that? The kinds of tests that we have, 
We have a left tail test, a right tail test, and a two tail test. And you know, if the alternative hypothesis has a less than symbol pointing to the left, we have a left tail test. So you know, the rejection region is in the left tail, the critical value is to the left, all that kind of stuff is in the left. So um, I have a left tail test. So which means I want to highlight, you know, less than I want to highlight the, you know, less than mu naught. Mine's already highlighted. I think I did that last night. But um, if it weren't, you just scroll over to it and press enter. You don't need to change color or draw anything. Calculate. Um, I'm going to take this. Again, this is the output for what I get when I use T test. I'm sorry, <laughs> Z test. At the end of the day, whenever you use something test, Z test, T test, one prop Z test, the stuff that you're going to do to get the um, tradition to get the uh, test statistic or the P value. This stuff is always going to give you the same information in a particular order. It's always going to be an alternative hypothesis first, then it's going to be a test statistic and then it's going to be a P value. OK, so and then whatever is left in terms of like, um, you know, statistical values that correspond to the situation. So it's always alternative hypothesis. And by the way, you see I write HA for alternative hypothesis. H1 is also another way to represent alternative hypothesis, right? Um, we said that yesterday, three ways that you could, depending on which textbook you use or whatever, right? Um, so, I mean, look, I don't really have to think much about this because the calculator does it for me. If I were not using the graphing calculator, like if I were using formulas, it's really just a plug and shut formula anyway. So my test, oopsie. My test statistic is, turn that around, negative 2.839. How do they want me to round? Round into two decimal places. So negative 2.84. Now, this next part is probably the part that is con the confusing part. At this um, significance level, alpha equal to 0 0.03, the rejection region is. This is indirectly telling you to use, uh, where is it? The traditional method. How do I know that? Because they're talking about the rejection region. And if you remember, when I talked about the rejection region, it corresponded to a critical value. And I said, in the traditional method, we compare the test statistic to that value. Is it within the rejection region? So this is indirectly asking you for the critical value and asking you to use the traditional method. Um, it's not a great way of like presenting that though, I have to be honest, but that's indirectly what it's doing. So if I have a left tail test, then my rejection region is in the left tail. Alpha is the area of the rejection region, always and forever. And CV, the critical value is always the Z score or T score, depending on which you know uh, distribution you're on, that corresponds to that rejection region. Being that we have Z scores, because sigma is known, my critical value will be found by doing inverse norm. So I would do inverse norm, and it's a Z score. And um, again, if you guys remember, inverse norm always wants, I don't know why this is happening. I think I just keep touching something by accident. Um, inverse norm is always going to ask for the area to the left, unless you have that option. Um, like this one, if you have this option, second vars, inverse norm, you could tell it where the area is, but not everybody has this option. So if you don't, then it's automatically assumed area to the left. But the nice thing about this one is it's a left tail test, so we already know the area to the left is 0 0.03. Do not confuse, I said this yesterday, don't confuse this mean and this standard deviation with anything here. Because yeah, these values talk about the hypothesis test, but whenever we're finding a z-score, we're automatically on a standard normal distribution curve, where the mean here is zero and the standard deviation is one. So don't confuse the two, I've seen that happen. So that's all I have to do here, paste, boom. So my um, critical value is negative 1.88. And I think we're rounding that probably to two, yeah, two, right? So Z is negative 1.88. Now, process of elimination, being that I know that it's a left tail test, I know that I'm not gonna have two critical values. 
I know that I'm most likely not going to get a positive critical value because it is a left tailed test. So now it's between, you know, these two. And then I know that it's this. The rejection region is to the left of the z-score. So the rejection region is z less than negative 1.88. So this is my answer. <laughs> Bubble out in it. Okay. I hope that makes sense. So this is indirectly talking to me or telling me to find the critical value and then use the traditional method to run my test. Again, I'm not the best way of asking you for it, you know, especially like right away, but that's what it's doing. Um, anytime you talk about a rejection region, you're always kind of like talking about a critical value. Now it says the decision is to blah. Now you could do this two different ways. Um, obviously, like I said, where is it? It's indirectly telling you to do the traditional method. You need to determine if the test statistic is in the rejection region, which you can do because they asked you for the test, the test statistic and they asked you for the rejection region and I drew it here. So I'll do it in red. So the test statistic is negative 2.84. If I'm comparing this to the critical value, which is negative 1.88 on a you know real number line, this value, the test statistic, negative 2.84 is to the left of this value, negative 1.88, which means the test statistic is to the left of the critical value or within the rejection region, is within the rejection region. And we call it a rejection region for a reason, because if it is there, then we reject the null hypothesis. So our conclusion is to reject the null hypothesis, right? So this is indirectly telling me to use the traditional method to run my test bubble that in, whatever. <laughs> we never really use this terminology, accept the null and accept the alternative. We never really use that. It's always reject the null or fail to reject. So I could probably eliminate those two. Um, one more thing, just if you like the p-value method to practice it as well, you're always comparing the p-value to alpha and you happen to have the p-value because you did this calculator trick. Your p-value is up here. If you want to verify your conclusion, you can very quickly, visually, without even really doing much, I'll write it down here, but your p-value, I guess I could fit it here, your p-value is approximately 0 0.0023, and your alpha, they told you, was 0 0.03. It is clearly obvious that the p-value, which is 0 0.0023, is smaller than alpha. And when that happens, when the p-value is less than or equal to the alpha, we reject the null hypothesis. So it brings me to the same conclusion. You don't have to do both methods, but you can verify if you want to. Some people really prefer the p-value method because it's just really quick. You don't even have to do anything. Traditional method is a nice little visualization of what's happening and drawing it does help, um, but you don't have to do it that way. Um, so suppose you mistakenly rejected the null hypothesis. So look, now we're talking about type 1 and type 2 errors. I have a type 1 error when I am rejecting a null hypothesis when it is true. I have a type 2 error when I'm failing to reject a null hypothesis. Being that my conclusion was to reject the null, then the only potential error that I can have is a type 1 error because that error occurs when I'm rejecting a null hypothesis when I shouldn't. So the possible error they don't ask me to interpret it, is this one, type one, because I'm rejecting the null. So, you know, it's not as bad as you think, right? And I want you to remember that. It's never as bad as you think. But I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and say that, in my opinion, sometimes the way that this is represented makes it more confusing than it has to be. So I'm going to stop recording there for a second.